Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. We're delighted you're here for this next event. And um, in, in view of the size of the space and the uh, dispersion of the seating, I wonder if I could ask those of you who are sitting towards the back to move up a little closer to the front so we have a little more intimate sense of the conversation. Um, we don't want our speakers to feel that they're talking to people who are too far away. Thank you for agreeing to do that. I think probably all of you who are here today are well aware of the occasion that brings us together, so I won't spend too much time describing it. We are here to prepare to hear on Palm Sunday afternoon the U.S. premiere of The St. Luke Passion by James McMillan, co-commissioned by Duke Divinity School, uh, along with the uh, Radio Orchestra of the Netherlands, is that the right name? And the uh, Birmingham Symphony Orchestra and uh, one more, Britain Sinfonia. We have uh, been honored to be working closely with James McMillan over the last couple of years with a group of faculty from Cambridge University and from the Divinity School here. And this is the fulfillment, the coming to fruition of a process of conversation. And we're all very excited to hear for the first time in live performance the St. Luke Passion on Sunday. We have the very special opportunity here this afternoon to hear the composer, James McMillan, speak about the work. And then we're going to have a response from Professor Sarah Coakley of Cambridge University for a few minutes. And once uh, she has spoken, we'll ask uh, James McMillan to respond to a, a few questions she will pose, and then we'll open it up for discussion from the floor. The, uh, the conclusion of this afternoon's program is going to be a performance of another McMillan work called Kiss on Wood. We are going to have Professor Jeremy Begbie on the piano and Sarah Griffin on violin to perform this work. We'll start just a little before 6.30. I'm told it's about eight minutes in length. Uh, if you, and I will announce it at the time. If you need to leave at 6.30 sharp, we would probably ask you to leave before the piece begins because we don't want interruption during the course of it. If you haven't heard it before, you're in for a remarkable treat. Uh, uh, I heard it myself performed for the first time in the King's College Chapel in Cambridge uh, by uh, Professor Begbie and another string player. So it's, it's a remarkable work. That'll be the, the culmination of the conversation now, and it will be a little foretaste of the kind of thing we'll be hearing on Sunday. Just one last announcement, which is that tomorrow, at 12.30 in uh, room 0016 downstairs in this building, we will have a panel discussion involving Professor Coakley, Professor David Ford from Cambridge, and Professor Alan Torrance from St. Andrews University on the future of theology. So if some of you are interested, that will be another opportunity to participate in the remarkable events of this week. All right, well, I'm going to turn it over now, and let's welcome James McMillan to Duke University. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a, a delight to be here again at Duke University, and uh, uh, it, it's been a marvelous journey, especially for me, uh, but for all the, the panel involved in these ongoing discussions culminating in the events of this week. Um, Jeremy Begbie has asked me to talk about what it means to be a composer of faith in the current culture, both in terms of the world of modern classical music and in the wider sphere. 
To do this, I want to make reference to an earlier British Catholic composer, Edward Elgar, and deal with the challenges he faced in his own time. I would like to begin with, though, with some words, quite, quite a few words, on my new St. Luke Passion, which has been the catalyst for these discussions and events here at Duke this week. I've been continually drawn back to the Passion story. I've always enjoyed a, a fruitful fascination with it. And there are deep reasons through history why artists and composers have been attracted to it, right up to our own times. The story is compelling and the images are powerful, prompting a variety of responses. Each time I return to it, I try to and find different perspectives. Some works are purely instrumental reflections following Haydn's example, such as uh, a work of mine called 14 Little Pictures uh, for Piano Trio, uh, based on the 14 Stations of the Cross, or Triduum, which is a collection of three orchestral works based on the three liturgies before Easter, uh, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter Vigil. Uh, others follow more familiar formats with choir, such as my seven last words from the cross, or the St. John Passion. My setting of the St. John Passion took a particular approach, examining the human drama, and was almost operatic. So, returning after a five-year interval, I wanted to take an alternative direction. St. John stands apart from the other three synoptic gospel writers who share structure and common material. And of those three, St. Luke has a special appeal for me. As well as relating Christ's life and teachings, Luke is concerned with the idea of the kingdom of God, which points forward to the same author's Acts of the Apostles. This started me thinking about a more spiritual, a more inward, and a more paired back approach to create a focus work lasting about 75 minutes in length. I decided to frame the passion narrative with a prelude exploring the Annunciation to set the scene and a postlude taking us beyond the crucifixion to the resurrection and the ascension. These two movements incorporate gospel texts where Luke explains or, or tries to reflect on or um, implies the, what the kingdom of God is. But the main body of the work sets chapters 22 and 23 complete. The other major decision for the St. Luke was to use English throughout. I'd been struck at performances of my St. John Passion, uh, how engaged the audience was with the narrative sections in English and several people, perhaps not church regulars, came to tell me how the story had spoken to them as if for the first time. This was perhaps because we are so used to either the Latin settings or to the 18th century German when we hear the Bach passions. So I opted for English only and decided not to include any extraneous texts beyond Luke's Gospel. In my St. John Passion, there is much intertextuality, where each section has a coda made up of a Latin reflection, usually taken from a liturgical text for Good Friday. I decided to d dispense with added text altogether in the new piece and focus entirely on the gospel at hand. There are other things dispensed with too in the St. Luke. Excluding interpolated texts, such as reflective arias, offered the possibility of a limited role for soloists, and I decided to go the full way and do without the usual tenor evangelist and bass Christ. Everything would be sung by choral forces. This posed quite a few challenges for me as a composer and for the chorus, who would have to be very busy. I'd used a chamber choir narrating the story in the St. John Passion, and I envisage in the St. Luke Passion a flexible approach with the choir, directing, the choir director deciding which tutti passages could be sung by a semi-chorus 
and which single lines might be better sung by a soloist or a chamber group or a smaller group drawn from the choir. I tried to make the choral writing as varied as possible, sometimes homophonic, sometimes with upper or lower voices alone, at other times just a unison line. The crowd sections move into polyphony to show the chaotic, angry or fearful world of the street. He, for example, is an example of, uh, of what I'm meaning. This is a, an excerpt from the, the original performance, the premier performance in Amsterdam a few weeks ago. The use of a children's choir as Christ is new. Any passion that casts Christ as a soloist immediately makes him take human form as an adult male, whereas I wanted to examine his otherness, his sanctity, and his mystery. Employing a children's choir grants a measure of innocence to Christ as the sacrificial lamb, while the vocal line is either in unison or in three parts, reflecting the oneness or Trinitarian implications of God. I've written for children's voices in a, in a large oratorio before, in quickening, and have gained a lot listening to youth choirs involving my own children over the years. In the United Kingdom, we are spoilt with excellent young choristers, thanks to the cathedral and collegiate systems. But hearing quickening performed around the world has introduced me to equally impressive children's choirs in countries such as the Netherlands, uh, New Zealand, and here in the United States. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing uh, the marvelous children's choir that you have here in Duke for, t uh, I'll hear them, hear them tomorrow at the rehearsal. Uh, here is uh, the moment where the children's choir, representing Christ, sing for the first time. Okay. Uh, up to 2005, I'd written works of varying difficulty for choir, up to challenging repertoire for choirs of professional soloists such as the 16 or the BBC Singers. But since then, I've also wanted to create a body of work that could be tackled seriously and realistically by good university, church or community choirs. I've spent my life with amateur choirs and value them very much. So in my two sets of the Strathclyde Motets, 
which I, I know are sung here by the Duke uh, Chapel Choir, I accepted the challenge of writing modern music that is simple and readily performable. I'm similarly hoping that the St. Luke Passion can be performed by a wide range of abilities. This first performance that we saw, or we're seeing here, was given by professional forces in the, in the Netherlands, but the US premiere here will be given by an excellent amateur university chapel choir. I've tried to be helpful, providing pitch cues and harmonic support, using simple modalities, avoiding angular leaps, keeping sections in repeating metrical schemes, and so on. The orchestration was also dictated by this paired back approach and practical issues for choirs that might want to hire an orchestra and can't always afford additional brass or percussion. But it's taken me back to the Baroque origins of the oratorio, employing a distinctive Handelian chamber choir with organ and timpani. The orchestral core incorporates pairs of oboes, bassoons, horns and trumpets. There is a single flute and a clarinet. The use of organ together with cello or double bass solos gives a continual feel, but support for the chorus is also at times provided by the string or wind choirs. The genesis of this St. Luke Passion is unusual. Not long after the St. John Passion premiere, I was in discussion with Jeremy Begbie, uh, who then set up the Duke Cambridge collaboration a group of American and British theologians, theologians, biblical scholars and writers. I met with the group several times since its inception in Holy Week 2010. The Duke, Cambridge, the Duke Cambridge group's research and reflections have informed but never interfered with my compositional process and in reflection I hear its influence from the outset. The St. Luke Passion begins neither with Satan entering into Judas nor at the Mount of Olives, but with a thrice repeated choral cry, Maria. This passion beginning with a prelude, which focuses on the incarnation, and closing with a postlude, which alludes to resurrection and ascension. Together, the prelude and postlude provide an intentional framework for the entire work which was informed by the extraordinary intellectual and human generosity of Jeremy Begbie and his colleagues. So this is the very opening of the work. One of these colleagues in the uh, Duke Cambridge group is the Irish poet Michal O'Shiel. Uh, some of you may have heard uh, reading his poems last night. Poets can have a very interesting take on religion, which can be a wonderful complement to the thoughts of theologians and biblical scholars. 
Religion in our times, these secular times, can be illuminated by the thoughts of poets, as was heard in the contributions of Michal in our group discussions and in the reading of his own work. Another Irish poet, Seamus Heaney, has referred to the big lightening, the emptying out of our religious language. And the Welsh poet, David Jones, saw the English language littered with dying signs and symbols, especially those associated with our Judeo-Christian past. Michael Simmons Roberts, an English poet with whom I collaborate a lot, says that the resultant impoverishment hasn't just affected poets, but readers too. And this has been borne out by the now common struggles of English literature teachers in schools and universities to provide the biblical and historical literacy necessary to make sense of Milton, Dunn, Herbert, Eliot, and so on. This, one might say, was the unintended or indeed the intended result of what might be described as the Enlightenment project, which was meant to see off religion, except that hasn't happened. In his book of essays, Post-Secular Philosophy, Philip Blonde suggests that secular minds are only now beginning to perceive that all is not as it should be, that what was promised to them, that is, self-liberation through the limitation of the world to human faculties, might after all be a form of self-mutilation. To which Michael Simmons Roberts adds, the romantic myth of the uncommitted artist that is, a free-spirited free -spirited and unshackled from the burdens of political, religious, and personal commitment was always an empty one. To be alive in the world is to have beliefs and commitments, and these extend at some level to politics and theology. But this myth has left us with a terror of the imagination enthralled to a belief. Surely this could limit the scope of the work, may even reduce it to a thin, preconceived outworking of doctrine or argument. But this fear was always unfounded. The counterexamples are obvious, including great 20th century innovators like Eliot, Jones, Auden, Moore, Berryman, Bunting. And there's an equivalent list in the other arts too. Music's list would include Stravinsky, Schoenberg, Messiaen, Poulenc, Goubaï Dolina, Schnitke, and others. The relationship between creative freedom and religious belief is far from limiting. Most of these writers and composers would argue, on the contrary, that their religious faith was an imaginative liberation. Some, like David Jones, have said that this withering of religious faith and the resulting negative reduction of imaginative liberation represents a parching of our culture, a parching of truth and meaning, a drying up of historical associations and resonances leading to an inability for our culture to hold up what he calls valid signs. The opposite of Jones's valid signs would be invalid signs. For example, T.S. Eliot disapproved of the rejection of tradition. His scathing critique of William Blake's obsession with inventing a pseudo-religious worldview, self-consciously at odds with Judeo-Christian roots, is fascinating. He regarded Romantic modernism's rejection of our religious roots as a distraction from the vocation of writing original poetry. Eliot saw a, frame, a strong framework as the means of avoiding the parching of the poetic flow and as a conduit to a fuller and truer vision. And this very framework of theology and tradition held to be an essential grounding for, grounding for Eliot is the very focus of disdain and rejection to our contemporary prejudices. These prejudices have been felt by composers too, and not just in our own age. The musicologist and conductor John Butt wrote, Elgar's Catholic upbringing tends to be underplayed in most writings on the composer, but it may nevertheless be one of the most significant sources of his compositional character. By deflecting attention away from myself for a little while, uh, I want to talk about this composer, Edward Elgar, um, and in particular uh, his masterpiece, The Dream of Gerontius. It's a setting of the great poem by John Henry Newman about the death of a man and his journey, the journey of his soul to, into the presence of God uh, uh, through purgatory <coughs> and uh, elsewhere. 
I was thinking about uh, this statement about Elgast Catholicism recently when browsing the web page of the, L the London Philharmonic Orchestra uh, for a recent performance of the Dream of Gerontius. Nowhere was the composer's Catholicism mentioned, and even the poet whose work he set, John Henry Newman, was ignored. Rather, we are told that, quote, while the Dream of Gerontius isn't as a, isn't as a, sorry, while the Dream of Gerontius isn't as explicitly patriotic as some of Elgar's other works, it is still tinged with the idea of empire as a vehicle for struggle and sacrifice. It goes on, unfortunately. Indeed, the story behind the setting of Gerontius revolves around one of the greatest heroes of the empire, General Gordon of Khartoum, whose annotated copy of the text was reproduced in the Midlands and given to Elgar on his wedding day. Since the composition of Gerontius, composers, uh, commentators have fallen over themselves in an attempt to paint Elgar's Catholic faith as weak or insignificant. Even his biographer, Gerald Northrop Moore, says this. It is therefore perhaps inevitable that when, when he produced The Dream of Gerontius, a setting of a poem by a Roman Catholic cardinal, which explores various tenets of the Catholic faith, people should jump to the conclusion that his Catholicism underlay his whole life. But his faith was never that strong. <laughs> this anxiety on the part of some has nevertheless been explained recently by the Princeton scholar Charles Edward Maguire, who says, the popular negating of Elgar's Catholicism, both at his death and today, serves an obvious end. It makes Elgar's music safer, more palatable for a British audience. In essence, it creates an avatar for Elgar as the essentially English composer beyond the reach of any of the complicating factors of a partisan religion. Continual prejudice against Catholics and Catholicism was a simple fact within Elgar's world, and the composer's perception of this prejudice, along with such prejudice itself, coloured his moods, his reactions, and his judgments. Elgar was born in 1857. In 1791, Catholicism was still outlawed in England. The Catholic Emancipation Act was only granted in 1829. Elgar was alive during a tumultuous and tense period in English Catholic history. When is Catholic history ever anything but tumultuous and tense? But um, he was aware of being an, an outsider and part of a mistrusted minority. When he was born, Catholics weren't allowed to attend Oxford or Cambridge universities. The composer attended three Catholic schools, and Maguire makes clear what a Catholic school in 1860s England was like. He says, during Elgar's years in these three schools, he was trained in Catholic theology above all other subjects. Besides being theologically desirable, some saw teaching Catholic religion as a political necessity, since outside the, the confines of the church or the classroom, Catholics would still have to live within a larger world. As the Catholic journal The Rambler explained at the time, it is the height of cruelty not to arm them, that's Catholic students, with fit weapons to fight the battle of faith. We must recollect that religious controversy is not confined to the pulpit, the platform, and the periodical. It is not the essential privilege of the noble and the wealthy. Its sounds are heard as loudly in the workshop, the kitchen, and the field, as in the halls of a university. Maguire claims that in this crucial period, 1889 to 1905, Elgar was open, proud, and public about his Catholicism, Catholicism, even in the face of considerable hostility. He was a regular mass attender. He proclaimed himself Catholic in both media interviews and in his work, and acknowledged repeatedly the prejudice he had encountered throughout his life. Public proclamations of his faith appeared on the scores of his oratorios, which he dedicated, using the Jesuit slogan, AMDG, to the greater glory of God. At the first performance of The Apostles, Elgar presented the singers with postcard copies of Ivan Kranskoy's mystical painting, Christ in the Wilderness, its subject looking re realistically human and upset, and let it be known publicly that he composed The Apostles with a print of the painting in his study. He allowed Gerontius to be used as a fundraising piece for the building of the Catholic Cathedral in Westminster, 
uh, on June 6, 1903. All this from one whose Catholic faith was, according to eager and anxious commentators, never that strong. In a Radio 3 essay on Elgar and religion, the pianist Stephen Huff said, when he decided in 1899 to set Cardinal Newman's The Dream of Gerontius to music, he was taking an enormous risk. It was his first major commission, and his career was all set to take off. So to choose this deeply Catholic text in a country where papists were a suspicious, despised, and even ridiculed minority was to court disaster. So he went ahead with total disregard for any possible censure or disfavor. So it's hard to believe that the words had no religious meaning for him at a time, especially as he was aware that his faith, that his faith was an impediment to his career. If it is true that the dream of Gerontius is indeed a work of vision, then it was a vision burnished with courage, foolhardiness even, and gained singularly through a, a particularly defined religion, religious tradition and sensibility. This was the kind of framework regarded as vital and necessary by T.S. Eliot when he outlined the conditions required for outstanding visionary art and which had been so eluded or had been so self-consciously rejected by others. <coughs> Elgar was to suffer for his vision as perform performances of the dream were banned as inappropriate in Gloucester Cathedral for a decade after the premiere. And performances in places like Hereford and Worcester were only permitted with large sections of the text bowdlerized with the objectionable bits taken out. It is thought by some that the vehemence of the reaction impacted greatly on the composer, even to the extent of him gradually losing his faith over the rest of his life. He, he may also have been seduced by the fame and praise which came his way in the wake of his more secular instrumental works, which turned him into a, nat a national treasure. Indeed, he was to become Britain's official composer, being made a baronet, awarded the Order of Merit, and appointed as master of the king's music. Proclaimed as essentially English, he be became a totem of nationalism. Enjoying all that, why go back to the depredations of Catholic martyrdom? But it was from this religion of martyrs and saints that Elgar drew his most unfettered freedom to visualize a work of greatness. The etymology of the word religio is interesting as it implies a kind of binding. David Jones says the same root is in ligament, a binding which supports an organ and assures that organ its freedom of use as part of a body. And it is in this sense that I use, here use the word religious. It refers to a binding, a securing. Like the ligament, it secures a freedom to function. The binding makes possible the freedom. Cut the ligament and there is atrophy, corpse rather than corpus. If this is true, then the word religion makes no sense unless we pre presuppose a freedom of some sort. This implies that supreme visionariness requires religion and theology. Now there's an interesting and challenging idea. How would that go down in today's fashionable citadels of metropolitan bien pensant culture? Michael Simmons Roberts explained, there's a popular view influenced by romanticism that only the pure, unfettered imagination can produce the great work. Poets should not be religious or overtly political or committed to anything much outside the poetry. Poets should be freewheeling, free-thinking, free spirits as if that meant anything. David Jones's implication is that the idea of the free-spirited artist is a myth and a delusion. The binding makes possible the freedom and opens the eyes to the vision. Major modernist composers, finally, ladies and gentlemen, major modernist composers of the last 100 years were, in different ways, profoundly religious men and women. Stravinsky was as conservative in his religion as he was revolutionary in his musical imagination, with a deep love of his orthodox roots as well as the Catholicism he encountered in the West. He set the Psalms, he set the Mass, he set the Ave Maria and the Our Father. He was a believer. Schoenberg, the other polar great of 20th century modernism, was a mystic 
who reconverted to a practicing Judaism after the Holocaust and pondered deeply on the spiritual connections between music and silence. Much of his later work is a reflection of his Jewish culture and indeed its theology. Olivier Messiaen was famously Catholic and every note of his unique contribution to music was shaped by a deep religious conviction and liturgical practice. The list of composers in recent times uh, showing a high degree of religious resonance is substantial, covering a whole generation of post-Shostakovich modernists from behind the old Iron Curtain. Goretzky, Arvo Pert, Cancelli, Schnitke, Gubaidulina. Again, courageous figures who stood against the prevailing dead-hand dead orthodoxies of the day. And in my own country, after Benjamin Britten, have come Jonathan Harvey, John Taverner, and many others. So far from being a spent force, religion has proved to be a vibrant, animating principle in modern music and continues to promise much for the future. It could even be said that any discussion of modernity's mainstream in music would be incomplete without a serious reflection on the spiritual values, belief and practice at work in composers' minds. The search for the sacred seems as strong today in music as it ever was. Perhaps that search now, as it was with Elgar in the lead up to the dream of Gerontius, is the bravest, most radical and most countercultural vision a creative person can have in the attempt to re-sacralize the world around us. Thank you very much. From Professor Sarah Copley. First, my sincere thanks to Jeremy Begbie, Dean Richard Hayes, and all the other Duke Divinity faculty here today, our donors, our uh, Duke musicians, and above all, James Macmillan himself, for the extraordinary privilege of being one of the ones who's been in conversation with him, the composer, during the incubation of his new St. Luke Passion. I think this is in itself has been a transformative event for us all and raises profound questions about how creative work, whether in music, poetry, art, or theology itself, can in some sense be expanded or enriched interpersonally. To what extent the St. Luke Passion would have been a different product without this five-year experimental interchange is a counterfactual that must remain sometime somewhat mysterious and unknown and perhaps only James Macmillan himself can pronounce on that. But certainly this unique experiment has been different, I suspect, from the sometimes tense, or, although creative, interaction that occurs between a composer and his librettist. But what I want to say now in response to James Macmillan will, I hope, continue this rather unchartable interaction and act as a certain curtain opener to the performance on Sunday and to a passion which in itself is essentially interactive, drawing the listener deep into its own conflicts and resolutions. Let me just make three points which pick up on three elements in what James Macmillan has just offered us, and in each case I shall end the point with a question to Jimmy specifically, but more widely to you all. The first point is about what might be called the Gospel of Luke reimagined through this new work. And I think Jim has been over modest about this because I think the, uh, the effect of what's been done here in the interaction between um, the theological discussion and the product is very remarkable and unique. So a comment first on the relation between the biblical text of Luke the distinctive theology of Luke, the libretto, and the music. James Macmillan had already started to immerse himself in the Gospel of Luke when we began this experimental interchange, and he already had certain intuitions, I seem to recall, um, about weaving parts of the Gospel not in the Passion narratives 
in and through them, especially the recurring Lucan theme of the kingdom of God. So, as I recall the beginning of an idea that the passion narratives might, as it were, be wrapped within encircling motifs, otherwise central to the gospel, this was bubbling beneath the surface in the composer's mind early on, but I think it was precisely here that our sustained communal meditations on Luke, both scholarly and spiritual, may have had the greatest impact on the final outcome. The extraordinary Marian encircling of the whole work, this opening with this great cry, Maria, and which is answered by constantly coming back to the place of women, and Mary in particular, throughout the gospel, throughout the text. The repeated motifs, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. And also, how can this be, posti, how can this be, that come out of the Magnificat? And then the wonderful phrase about the tender mercy of our God from the Benedictus. These are central and weave through the entire work. And then there's that pervasive Lucan paradox of the kingdom that also is there in the Magnificat and recurs throughout, that the poor will be raised up and the proud cast down, along with Luke's distinctive Christology of triumph through innocence and suffering. Christ's voice here, remarkably sung by the children's chorus, but as we saw in the first performance, almost entirely young women. Now these have become the light motifs woven in to the whole passion story in Luke. And the result, as I see it, is that the whole work is implicitly a profound and unique theological meditation on the distinctive theology of Luke done through the medium of music. One that was, as it were, metabolized through the interactive process of discussion and exchange. So my first question for James Macmillan out of this point is, can you say, Jimmy, in retrospect, what was distinctive for you as a composer about this theological conversation about Luke as opposed to your normal practice of writing with a poet or a librettist? What were the central spark points, if you can remember? And there I ask, would you ever do it again? <laughs> Because I think this is the first time something like this has been done. And I think it has produced something that should be used in the future as a unique manifestation of how music can reflect on distinctive theology. Second point. I want to ask about the distinctiveness of passion music as opposed to other oratorio or religiously inspired music such as Elgar's Gerontius that Jimmy was reflecting on. And let me hazard a hypothesis here for your consideration. What for me makes the passion music particularly significant, or the passion narrative first and foremost, is that it leads us in a kind of diachronic narrative through the mediation of what might be called unbearable contradictions. So something happens in the recitation of the passion in which everything that we bring to it that is without meaning in our life because it unbearably constricts us in our sense of logical resolution is put to the test and moved through. Of course, this happens just in the telling of the narrative verbally. But I think that music adds something to that that not only intensifies the emotional impact of these unbearable tensions, but also can resolve or ride beyond them in its own ineffable way because of its particular unspeakable emotional impact. Now, in the Bach St. Matthew Passion, with which many of you are familiar, this process, of course, is managed by a form of internalization of the meaning of the passion as each dramatic moment is answered by a reflective, pietistic aria that thinks its way into what is happening. Until finally, right at the end, in a remarkable bass, Arios, Arioso and Solo, the, um, the final reflector 
uh, entombs the dead Christ in his heart. So the whole process is one of moving through various forms of emotion, whether it be those who are rejecting Christ or those who are sustaining and staying with him. And finally, at the end, you're meant to have actually um, pietistically imbibed and internalized the whole story. Now, in this new passion of Macmillan's, in contrast, I think the unbearable tensions are dealt with differently, since right from the start, as we saw, the chorus bears the whole bur burden of telling the story. Whilst these innocent children's voices, girls and boys, represent Christ's simultaneous purity and suffering. And as Jeremy Begbie writes beautifully in his program notes, the extraordinary contrasts of dissonance and consonance, sound and silence throughout this passion are the means of mediating the atoning power of the cross, which finally defies logical and theological explanation. So my second question, leading on from this, after reflecting on the specific nature of passion music, given the archetypal nature of such passion music, does it not in some sense transcend ecumenical theological differences, ecclesiastical theological differences, in a way that Elgar's Gerontius could not, because it was a specifically Newmanesque text? So do you, James Macmillan, see your passions as somehow distinctively Roman Catholic renditions of the passion, as some might think, because the St. John is cut through with uh, Latinate texts from the liturgies of the day. Should we somehow expect to proselytize for our churches through our passion music, to put it naughtily? Or is there something about music and specifically passion music that transcends ecumenical divisions and might even actually have a special role in doing so. Finally and thirdly, a word about passion music in the secular world. Jimmy has made a poignant plea for the importance of traditional religious forms in poetry and music as binding us into new freedom. And Michael Simmons Roberts speaks for many in Britain in arguing that in the secularized world of Northern Europe, North Carolina is different, of course, the poet and the musician may well bear the responsibility for keeping open the doors of transcendence in a way that the theologian or the ecclesiastic often cannot to a jaded generation. Yet the philosopher Charles Taylor has rightly stated even those of a secular age remain half haunted by religious enchantment in Northern Europe. And what some call the semiotic eruptions that can occur through aesthetic expression often speak louder than words in this realm to draw people back to God. Thus, I see James Macmillan's decision to include, he didn't mention this, it's a remarkable fact, to include just so subtly but so powerfully the resurrection ascension at the end of his Luke Passion as deeply significant in this particular context of a secular northern European world. He's inviting us back into hope, it seems to me. The traditional German passions do not do this, of course. They stop where the passion stops on Good Friday. And I've always thought that Bach's Easter cantatas seem strangely lame and unsuccessful in comparison with the desperate endings, the wonderfully powerful endings of his passions. So my third and last question is this. How consciously have you, James Macmillan, chosen to end this particular passion with a message, a subtle message of hope for a despairing secularized listener or for a sophisticated despiser? In your great St. John Passion, you left us with an amazing non-verbal last moment in which life and death contend. And have you consciously felt the need this time literally to lift us up into heaven at the end of this astonishing new piece of work? Thank you.
to these questions. Well, well, I'll try and answer the questions. This is a difficult bit. Um, Sarah, many, many thanks for that, uh, and thanks for such a, a deep consideration of, of the music and, and also what I've, I've tried to say about it. I find it quite difficult talking about my own music. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to talk about music, full stop. Um, and, and, uh, and composers tend to be the most tongue-tied when it comes to talking about what they do. Um, nevertheless, I am fascinated by others' fascination uh, for what we do. And that's why I love spending time with theologians and poets and, uh, and people who love music. But I've come to that love of music through uh, uh, very, very different ways. And, and that uh, experience of the panel, as it were, um, the experience of the, the, the group, the Duke Cambridge group, um, was unique. I said earlier today at, at one of the sessions that when I tell my fellow composers what I've been up to, uh, they're totally bemused. Some are horrified. Um, they, they can't imagine how it would be to, to work in that kind of close collaboration uh, with others. Um, they suspect uh, too much influence from the panel and no matter, no matter what I say, they, they never believe me that there wasn't any interference at all. Um, what there was, was an extraordinary generosity and a deep scholarship that I was able to immerse myself in. Uh, 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 and um, I, I've never done that before. And would I do it again? Yes, I would. Uh, it wouldn't, not with every piece, uh, but th there has to be, I think, a, a, a deep uh, preparation for any composer, especially when you're dealing with extra musical subject matter, such as the the narrative of, of, of the crucifixion. Um, there was something very distinctive about this discussion then, and I would heartily recommend it to my fellow composers. They would have to be of a particular sensibility to be able to cope with it. Um, um, it, it would have to be the most natural thing in the world for them to enter into that wider discussion. The thing is, composers can uh, open up and discuss things uh, sometimes intelligently, um, and uh, <laughs> uh, they're not always. And um, th there, is a, 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 there is something in the, in the composer's mentality. It's a bit of a hangover, I think, from man rom romanticism, which I, I've talked about already in, in my, my, my talk, uh, which um, tends to see oneself as, as, as a hero, a singular hero, um, uh, ba battling a, a, a singular musical cause, uh, to hell with the consequences and uh, others don't really matter. Um, however, I, I think that the sense of a composer being in a community, which has come out in some of the discussions we've had today already, um, <coughs> uh, um, makes complete sense to me and um, it's an extension of that communitarianism, as it were, uh, to, to see that the work of the panel, to, the work of the, the um, the group uh, has been really integral and, and very, very worthwhile. Uh, Gerontius. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, you're right, absolutely. The passion is more, the passion narrative is more universal than the story of Gerontius. What makes Gerontius universal is not Newman's poem, uh, good as it is, but Elgar's music. It is Elgar's music and the setting of this poem that has brought us a, a, a minority taste, one could say, a minority fascination into the public realm in a, a, a spectacular sense so that, so that people who do not share uh, the deep convictions of Newman or indeed Elgar at the time are able to engage with the, the power of, of uh, uh, the inspiration, the inspiration which brought forth the poem and, and more importantly the music and embrace it as if it were universal. So Elgar's genius as a composer was to universalize something which on the face of it might not have been. And I think therefore puts it into, this, into a similar bracket to the passion which all, all Christendom can share. Um, <clears throat> The whole question about proselytizing is very interesting, and I know it comes up in a lot of the discussions that Jeremy 
has with many of his uh, focus groups and his constituencies. I've seen uh, Jeremy uh, mercilessly uh, torn apart by some of his constituency back home in the UK um, because sometimes they don't get what music's about uh, or at least they prefer to think that, that the role of um, evangelizing should only be with popular culture because it has that wider reach. I, I think that's a mistake to see uh, culture in any form as mu purely and simply instrumentalist. Um, I'm, I didn't write this music to convert people. It may convert people, and maybe, may, maybe the Dream of Gerontius converted people. I don't think it was the, the purpose or, or the, the, the prime aim of the composer to do that. It was to make a, a piece of beauty, and in a sense to give witness to the, the source of that beauty, uh, and, and to share uh, that delight in what that source is, uh, in this case, God. Uh, I don't think that's proselytizing, but by giving witness to what truly motivates us as composers and artists uh, um, sets up a, a very profound communication beyond the, um, the crassness of mere proselytizing and makes uh, a dialogue, a human dialogue, between people who perhaps don't share worldviews uh, much more exciting uh, and, 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 and potentially fruitful. <clears throat> is this passion a, um, a con is there a conscious message of hope for the secular world in this passion I don't think it's conscious there's not much I do that's conscious to be honest uh, there's not much a composer does that's conscious most of what we do is subliminal it works at our uh, it works as if it's in a dream most of the time I feel as if I'm in a dream when I'm writing I wake up when I finish a piece of music, it feels like wakening, wakening up from a dream. Um, but will it communicate with a secular world? I hope so. And uh, it's a great source of delight to me that, for example, uh, this, the premiere that we saw little clips from took place in front of probably the most secular audience in the world, uh, the Dutch. Um, and uh, I was able to ha enter into that kind of dialogue. I, I, I value... Uh, the feelings and um, aspirations and experiences of my fellow men and women regardless of their religious worldview and to be able to share uh, a, a work which has meant so much to me with a, an audience that I, do, I know don't really uh, come halfway towards me in many things uh, was, was a great delight. Um, <clears throat> many of that audience though uh, unconventional religious thinkers, complete atheists, many, will nevertheless, if they love music, those who love music, will talk about music as being the most spiritual of the arts. It's a term that crops up a lot uh, amongst the, uh, the, the musically inclined, um, the, the, the vast crowds who come and see Bach Passions at Eastertide, many of them, probably the majority now in, in Northern Europe, will not be believers but they will speak about the deep spirituality of music and, and the fact that the, the spirituality of, of, uh, of music is a transformative thing. They engage with music, they love music, they listen to music because they are, they're aware that it has the power to point to something in them or about them, about us, that is more than the sum of our parts. Uh, and that is a, is a truly spiritual... Um, phenomenon, I think, in, in the thinking of modern man, and it's one of the reasons we should never give up hope in our uh, ongoing conversations uh, with those who don't believe. Well, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you. It should be noted that in that premiere in Amsterdam <clears throat> before this very secular audience, the work received a standing ovation at its conclusion, uh, which I'm told is not the typical custom among the Dutch uh, for works of, of uh, musical performance. So it touched something. 
We are now going to open the conversation to questions or responses from the audience, uh, questions for the composer, questions for the theologian, or simply reflections that you would like to offer. Yes, in the back. Uh, the community. Um, I don't know much about them, to be honest. Uh, but but I love chant and uh, and the very concept of chant uh, as it moves from culture to culture um, is something that. Uh, I'm fascinated by it. and I realize that the Taze community have their own version of chant. I've actually heard a lot of it, and, uh, not enough of it, but I, I can see the repetitive ritualistic aspect of Taze uh, has its roots in, in other forms of uh, uh, devotional chant. And the chant that I love most, I suppose, must be Gregorian chant. Um, and, and Gregorian chant has this uh, fundamental position in Western musical culture. It's there at the beginning, it's there that, it's there that it was there when it influenced composers of medi the medieval period and composers ever since have been drawing from Gregorian chant to make their own music. Palestrina's masses and motets are based on a lot of Gregorian chant. Uh, a lot of parody masses will, will use <coughs> many different sources but the Gregorian melodies are, are, are prime. Even into our own time, composers are still fascinated by chant. Peter Maxwell Davis, one of my uh, elder colleagues in, in, the, in, the, in the United Kingdom, says that he, uh, he, he, he has a copy of the Liber Usualis on his desk, and he delves into it all the time. You could say that a lot of the DNA, DNA of Western music, especially early music, can be found in Gregorian chant. But that's fascinating in itself because Musicologists have pointed uh, to the likelihood that chant uh, has its origins in even pre-Christian times in the synagogue and in the temple and uh, have drawn attention to certain contours in the most ancient chant that can be linked up and compared with the contours of uh, Jewish melodies from before the time of Christ. Indeed, it could be said that some of those melodies uh, now embedded in Western culture through chant, Gregorian chant, uh, could have been found in some kind of version that Christ himself would have sung. Christ and his contemporaries would have sung, which is a, a delightful thing to reflect on. We would like to ask, uh, I've been reminded that questioners come up to the microphones because we are recording the conversation and it will both help others to hear uh, and, and also get the question out. So please come forward to the, to the mics. Are all three live, Christina? The, that one, these two are live. Okay, good, thanks. Um, my question would be, as a composer, what part of your piece really draws out your, um, the most intense spiritual feelings that you have, and what compositional techniques did you use to convey those feelings in? arouse those feelings in the audience and in yourself? Thank you. Um, well, um, the question of the audience is quite a, an interesting one. Uh, those of you who are music students, are there music students here? Yes, good. Yes, I thought that was a music, a music student's question. Um, <laughs> uh, you will know that uh, throughout the 20th century there has been a kind of checkered relationship between composers and, and, and audience. Uh, um, there's reasons for that. We don't need to rehearse them just now, but when you think back to uh, Schoenberg, who, uh, who in the early part of the 20th century established private societies for the private uh, performance of new music, something strange was happening. And um, you could say that there was a, a parting of the ways. Perhaps the, the composers were moving into a laboratory phase of, of their thinking, a very necessary laboratory phase, and then of, of course in the wake of the Holocaust and the Second World War, you can understand why artists and composers especially would want to, uh, in a sense, expunge uh, tradition and start again. 
So you, this, this rather fraught relationship with audience that composers have had in, in the recent century uh, can sometimes be a consideration, so much so that even, uh, even I, who like audiences, um, uh, will, st will still, have, still say that I, I never think of the audience when I write. Now, that might seem arrogant, um, uh, but what I mean by that is that uh, uh, I don't have an ideal... I don't have an audience in mind, but I have an ideal listener in mind. And that I ideal listener is someone who is hungry and thirsty to encounter in music something they don't yet know. Now, the problem is that in, in the world of classical music, uh, the audi many of the audiences are not like that. They, they are there for... They, they value the museum culture aspect of classical music, uh, and so do I. Uh, um, but they know what they like and they like what they know and that's it. Now that's not what a living composer needs for in a listener. We need someone who has all antenna bristling. So what did I want an audience to feel uh, um, is an interesting question. Um, because you could, one should never second guess or even imagine what an audience would, would want or even look for in a piece of music. One has something that one wants to communicate in music and one does it. If, the, if it falls in deaf ears, as it does sometimes, would, would one just have to, has to take that. It's not necessarily the audience's fault, but it's not necessarily the composer's fault either. Maybe it's not a question of fault at all. But sometimes in our world, it's not just composer listener relationships but all of us are talking at cross pur purposes all the time and not necessarily communicating what, what I would hope though is that when a, a listener or an audience hears this work or any of my music that there'll be uh, uh, that the music will speak profoundly and fluently um, but hopefully they will know and realize that the music would be a very different kind of music indeed if it hadn't been for the very specific nature of its inspiration. In this case, the inspiration is uh, of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the story, uh, the, the retelling of, of the, the crucifixion narrative. Okay, other questions? Yes, Jeremy. You're director of music in your local church, Jeremy. What's the relationship between what you do there, Sunday by Sunday, which you take very seriously, and what you do on the international stage. Piece of it, not very much. Uh, in fact, I'm, I mean to say I'm director of music is a very grand title. The only reason I'm doing the music in that church is because no one else is doing it. <laughs> I'm not getting paid for it or anything. Um, it, and it's a, it's a, it's quite a challenge. It's a, it's a, it's one of the poorest uh, Catholic parishes in Glasgow. Um, uh, but it's, it's something that absorbs me totally. Uh, I'm very motivated by it because I, I, I'm, I'm interested both at an abstract level but also in a devotional level about what it is that motivates people to sing their prayers. Um, what, what, will, what will provoke song out of an ordinary non-specialist, non-musician who wants to come and take part in a ritual form of prayer such as the Mass? And, and that, that's a great challenge, and, and it, it, prov it provokes different kind of music from me from, from, from what we're about to hear here. It's very simple. Uh, it's chant-based. It's influenced by the chant, uh, because that, that Gregorian chant is the very sound of R Roman Catholicism. I this is the music you're writing for this choir, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. But it's very, very simple. Um, sometimes I find the odd little snatch of melody that... Uh, was written for that purpose will find its way uh, into a bigger piece. So th they're not entirely unconnected. There's sometimes a kind of transfusion of one thing, a kind of cross-fertilizing of one with the other that can be very useful. Yes, please come to the mic. Yes. Not, not that one, one of these others. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, why did you make Jesus' words to the daughters of Jerusalem the climax of everything he says in the piece? Hmm. That's a very interesting uh, observation. Um, 
the, the daughters of Jerusalem, when Jesus speaks uh, to the woman, um, seems, seems, to be, seems to have affected our, our young uh, chorister here as the climax of the piece. It may very well be. Um, I, it's, it's a moment I'm very proud of. Um, it, it's, a, it's a devastating text. Um, when you read it, either in liturgy or, or in the silence of your own self, you, you can't help but be affected by its power, uh, its, its tragedy, <coughs> uh, its, its beauty. And um, through, because, of it, because of its sheer uh, aching sadness, I think uh, it, it must have had, affected, had an effect on me as a composer to produce music of, 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 that, of that kind of degree of sadness. It's certainly the saddest moment in the, the piece. I would, I would say that. And I'm looking forward very much to hearing you sing it tomorrow at the rehearsal. And it, it's, a, it's a piece of distinctive Luke and passion narrative material. It isn't else. Instinctively picked up. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to tell us more about that? Why that is the case? Well, Richard, why don't you do it? Do you the New Testament's gone? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> You mean why it's why it's distinctively Lucan, or, yeah. or why? Well, it, it just it's doesn't appear in the other Gospels, mm -hmm. and I, I suppose it's it's part of the same theme that Sarah ref, referred to of the significance of roles of women in in, in Luke's Gospel, which mm -hmm. are quite significant, um, um, and the the sense of Jesus uh, mourning over Jerusalem because of its rejection of him and his message mm -hmm. is also a repeated motif in Luke's gospel. Mm -hmm. um, why all that is so, if that's the question, I don't know, but it just is. And it, it's it, part, of, part of your work has been to render uh, a musical composition that stays extremely close to the distinctiveness of Luke's text. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the manifestations of it. I, as long as I'm talking, I would also say that uh, on that point, another, another uh, manifestation of that is the thing Sarah asked you about, I think, about having the resurrection and ascension represented in the end of the composition. Mm -hmm. uh, part of our collaborative conversation was actually to press Jimmy very hard uh, to be conscious of the wider narrative context of the passion narrative within Luke's narrative composition and, uh, and theology, and I think that comes through in your choices about the prelude and, and postlude. We had another question uh, in the back. Uh, my question is for the composer. Um, I think I heard a quote from Bach's uh, Passion Chorale, um, and I was wondering if there were um, any more uh, of musical influences from other composers that you can talk about in composing the, your passion. Uh, yes, oh, well, there's lots of influences uh, from other composers. It's, uh, sometimes it's conscious, sometimes it isn't. It's just uh, many composers are sponges. We just uh, absorb so much we can't help it. It's, it's out there in the ether and um, we, are, we are composers because of other composers. It's other composers that made us want to do what we, we do. Um, <clears throat> the, in, in my St. John Passion I quoted from three separate sources uh, and I suppose uh, you've noticed that the Bach quote in the St. Luke and it was, again there's a, a, an attempt there to pair back uh, to focus down on limited, uh, self-limited choices. Uh, so it's just the Bach rather than, as it was in the, in the, in the St. John, some Victoria and even Wagner. Um, there was reasons for that. Those, those quotes of Wagner, it was Tristan um, and, and the Bach Passion Chorale again and, some, and the Victoria responses for Tenebrae were deliberate. They were, in a sense, homage to uh, great fi figures from the past, uh, two of which ha ha had tackled the passion story. Another probably did tackle the whole issue, but without knowing it, uh, and that's, that's Richard Wagner. 
Um, but that's another story. Um, with, with, with this piece, it's just simply the, the one melody or the, or the harmonized Bach chorale which uh, crops up at the end of chapter 23. Uh, it's, it's there in its entirety, played on the horns and the organ and harmonized by the other, uh, other instruments of the orchestra uh, in the lower parts of the orchestra. But the higher parts of the orchestra uh, go, have a very uh, strange, um, contradictory counterpoint. Uh, so it's not important for me just to quote other music. It has to be, in a sense, remolded. I think we're going to see the, 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 the very passage we're talking about. You said something towards the end of your answer section that I really appreciate. It's going to stick with me that the ideal listener in your mind is someone who uh, doesn't know, is eager to discover in music something they don't already know. And uh, I think that's a really great comment, uh, not in the least because I think the gospel writers would have hoped for a similar ideal reader in the gospel for the gospel stories. And it seems, I'm just reminded of the pilgrims at the end of Luke's gospel who seem to stand for how we should respond to this story as people who are eager to, to discover something that we didn't have eyes to see beforehand. So I, I really appreciate that comment. But it raises a question for me because I think that all artists to some degree then wrestle with what happens when uh, either the audience or the participant in your art form is not that ideal person. And I, I was wondering if you had any experience with or, if, or how you wrestle with uh, when that virtuous person is not the one who's either performing or receiving your piece, and if uh, the person who's not willing to discover something new, how they might respond to it, and, and what, and how you bear that in mind as as the composer for your piece. Oh, um, well, um, I mean, so sometimes, as I say, things will fall in deaf ears. It may, you, one may be deaf to something once and then come back to it. It's not necess necessarily the case that uh, the communication is dead full stop. Sometimes a, a, a kind of music will not get through on first encounter, but on, and that's, that certainly happened with me. I've heard music that uh, I suppose left me cold the first time I heard it, but it became, I grew to love it deeply as, li as life went on, as, as, uh, as the years went on. So it's not a, uh, it's, it's, it's not something that I, I feel that we should, composers should worry about too much because the uh, 
people can com come back to to the music uh, in their own time. One has to be patient, but I think audiences have to be patient too, uh, in the sense that the. Uh, I think that's right. I mean, people will, will speak honestly about. No, oh, it didn't. I find it interesting. They say uh, not just about my music, but any music that they don't know very well. Uh, fascinating, but no, I have to hear it again. That's a, a valid response. That's a. I think that's the response that many of us will have to. Um, it, it's the response I've had to many works that I've, I've got, come to love uh, over the years. Very generous response. Uh, uh, I, one possible gospel response would be to say, shake off the dust from your feet and move on to the next town, right? <laughs> um, but um, uh, your response was, let those who have ears to hear, hear. Yeah. <laughs> next question. You mentioned beauty and being witness to the source of beauty. Um, to me, beauty matters a lot, but when I come across Christians who are more of a utilitarian frame of mind and who say, well, Jesus said we should care for the poor and feed the hungry, and that's what we're supposed to do, and we're not supposed to waste our time doing things like composing music or painting pictures or so forth, um, and I really don't know what to say back to them other than Oh, well, I think it matters, but um, and not that those other priorities are not true. They're definitely in the Gospels. Why does beauty matter, though? What do you say? Well, this, I mean, I'd love to hear what Jeremy has to say about this, too, because I, I think he has had that reaction from many of his students <laughs> over the years who are deeply... Not here. Not here. No, no. <laughs> um, no pe people who are committed to... Uh, the work of God and, some, and perhaps see something like music as frivolous, uh, a distraction from the, the real uh, necessity of, of, of putting God's work into action. And uh, well, I, I, I think that truth, goodness, and beauty are indivisible, and we have deep in our culture an appreciation of the three, these three unequal terms. And um, without truth, you can't, you can't have beauty. Without goodness, you can't have beauty. Beauty, in a sense, is a, uh, perhaps a sign of the, the truth and goodness of God. Um, it, it seems perverse to avoid beauty uh, um, when it, is, it, 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 it can be so encapsulated or so created, even in just human living. Uh, but there is a strain in every religion uh, of, a, you, you call it a utilitarianism, um, a, a puritanism perhaps, a, 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 a fierce focus on one thing rather than getting a balance right. And, and if, if, the, 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 um, uh, if our forebears did want to, us to talk about goodness, truth and beauty, then, then they must have thought about a balance. Uh, being achieved between them. Professor Griffiths, and this will be our last question before we have the performance of Kiss on Wood. Uh, I've got a question about, um, I'd like to hear you think about the difference between sacred music being performed in a liturgical context as part of a service of worship on the one hand, and sacred music being performed outside that context in a secular venue as a concert on the other hand. Uh, whether you think that difference matters, what sort of a difference it is. So here's a possible analogy, very imperfect. You can often go to museums and see altarpieces displayed as objects for uh, contemplation as art objects, but they're no longer in churches. They've been taken from there for whatever reason and made uh, an object for the gaze of museum goers. Is the performance of sacred music in a secular concert hall like that or not? I think it can be like that for some, and it's a shame if it was like that. Um, I think it goes back to, I think a, a, a music audience uh, is not a museum audience because they do acknowledge the, the power of music and the spiritual nature of music. As I said earlier, uh, you'll find a lot of sceptical music lovers still using the term spiritual in the way that they engage. And they'll talk about their, 
um, being profoundly affected by, by, by music. Uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, the spiritual can happen in the concert hall um, as well as in the liturgy. Although, I would say this is a very different... Uh, music has a different purpose in liturgy. Uh, even a composer has a different purpose in liturgy because he has to provide a music that, has to, that, that is a vehicle for the prayers uh, of, of, of the people of God, as it were. It's music that has to carry the thoughts and prayers of those present um, uh, to the altar of God. And that's very different to what happens in a concert hall. And I think it's right for a composer who inhabits both worlds to be aware of the sensibilities and sensitivities of both and even the different requirements of both. So I find myself writing liturgical music in the knowledge that um, it will accompany sacred ritual and indeed uh, provide a backdrop or at least a, uh, a vehicle for other people's uh, spiritual focus. In, in, in the concert hall, it's a different focus. So, some, will be, uh, so, some will grasp the full spiritual uh, aspect of it, but there are others that will want to contemplate it like a, a, an object in a museum. Um, I, found, I found sometimes my purely liturgical music finding an, a, a, a place in a concert hall. Uh, I've got used to that. Uh, I, I've, got, I've, I've got to be used to it. Uh, I'm, I, I'm at ease with it. I, I'm at ease with the same work having uh, a life in two different contexts. And even a work like the St. Luke Passion, uh, first performance was in a secular space, a concert hall. Sunday's performance will be in a sacred space. Uh, there are nuances uh, that one has to take on board in all this. There's no right or wrong way of uh, performing and, and presenting sacred music. Thankfully, it can happen in different places. Well, we're about to now have a performance of one of uh, James McMillan's compositions. But before we do that, let's express our thanks to James McMillan and Sarah Copeland. Yeah, that's a good one. So thank you provocative uh, and illuminating conversation, and it simply whets our appetite all the more to uh, hear the performance on Sunday. The performance we're about to hear now, uh, A Kiss on Wood, is a first run at uh, a piece that will also be performed tomorrow afternoon in a composer's workshop at 2 p.m. in Bone Hall, <coughs> Bone Hall on the East Campus. I understand that workshop is open to the public as well. And um, uh, we're going to have a, a chance to hear it performed here right now by Professor Jeremy Begbie, who's the Thomas Langford Professor of Christian Theology, and by Sarah Griffin on violin. This will be the conclusion of our program. And thank you for coming. And we'll look forward to seeing all of you on Sunday.